Good afternoon and welcome to the PUC conversation. I would like to acknowledge both the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation and the Buvarung and Wandri peoples of the Kulin Nation. The trust traditional custodians of the land where the PUC events team meets, greets, works and creates. We pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge that people are attending, meeting, sharing with us today from other traditional lands and nations and, our, and extend our respects to their custodians, ancestors, elders and future leaders. On behalf of the PC Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to this wonderful conversation on tertiary computer science. I would love to uh, extend a warm welcome also to the people that are generously giving us their time today to share their experience and knowledge. So welcome to Eleanor, Alan and Richard. Richard is uh, taking the place of uh, Katrina, who was meant to be joining us from the University of Adelaide. And uh, the news today is awful for the university. So our thoughts are with her um, today as, the, as that university community uh, struggles in, in, in what is emerging as a weird year for all of us, 2020. I want to also give a warm welcome and acknowledge the PSC, the friends of PSC and the PSC elders. Uh, Wayne Fitzsimmons is on the line, who's the chair of the PSC Foundation. And I want to acknowledge Ker Kelly Hutchinson, who's the deputy chair and the state chairs and all of the friends of PSC who make this uh, such a wonderful place for the team at Slattery's to work. My name is Rachel Slattery and um, it's my honour to welcome you all here today. Today's PSC conversation is part of the Digital Innovation Festival. So please uh, go to the website because there is lots of wonderful things happening in the state of uh, Victoria. And because of the new reality we're in, uh, you, can, you can be anywhere in the world actually and enjoy the DIFF Festival. So please visit there. The PC Foundation uh, promotes ICT innovation and adoption. And the PC Heritage Project is all about finding and celebrating uh, the digital pioneers of Australia. So if you've got recollections, stories, anything that you want to share either on the Zoom chat today about your own uh, education and journeys um, or later on the PC Slack or just send an email to one of the wonderful PC friends, um, that would be fantastic because we're all trying to uh, discover more about um, the heritage of the wonderful digital world we, we now embrace. I have shared a couple of things in the Zoom chat too. So I suggest that you have, if you've got any questions to um, throw them in there and our esteemed panel will be able to answer them or at least try to. I've asked the three panelists to actually introduce themselves because their CVs are so um, wonderful. And I think it would be a great opportunity for us to hear about their journeys um, from university to now and the steps that they've taken. So Alan, I'm going to ask for you to, to take us a little bit on your journey um, from, from those early days. Would you, I invite you to, to, to begin. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And it's a pleasure to be here as part of the conversation. So my name's Alan Noble. I'm an electrical and engineering uh, undergraduate, uh, which I topped off with postgraduate um, studies in computer science. Uh, incidentally, uh, I considered pursuing a PhD in computer science as well. Uh, but unlike my co-panelists, I found the allure of industry to be just a, a little bit too strong uh, for me. I spent my entire career working with computers and software technology. I've lived and worked in Japan, uh, Europe, uh, the US, and, and of course, Australia. Uh, after graduating from Adelaide University, I lived in Japan for a few years in the early 80s. I developed everything there from restaurant software to pachinko pinball firmware. Uh, I speak Japanese and it's, it's a difficult language to translate. Uh, and as a result, I became quite fascinated uh, by the field of automatic language translation, which we now refer to as machine translation. My, I would say my career started in earnest uh, when I moved uh, to the US in 1986, um, getting that master's degree. 
uh, in computer science. Graduating from Stanford, I worked in the semiconductor industry uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, then I moved from that into internet software uh, and then computer networking. And eventually I ended up in the area of ocean conservation. I'll talk more about that. Uh, I've also founded software companies both in Silicon Valley and in Australia. Computer science has been at the heart of everything I've done uh, throughout my career. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Uh, these days, however, I'm really passionate about the environment and in particular, our oceans. Uh, in 2017, I founded the Australian Ocean Lab or OzOcean for short, with the mission of helping our oceans through technology. Before that, I was with Google in Australia for 11 years, uh, where I was head of engineering um, based out of Piermont in Sydney. Uh, in 2014, I founded my first nonprofit, or sorry, co-founded my first nonprofit, which was Startup Oz. Uh, we were an advocacy nonprofit with the mission of making Australia one of the best places in the world to, uh, to build a tech startup company. But something completely different, uh, I'm also an aspiring writer. I've published four short stories and I'm currently writing a book. Uh, I'm actually a big believer in the power of the written word, uh, whether it's for professional communications or for fun. Um, so that's really, uh, I guess, my career in a nutshell. And I'll come back to kind of how computer science uh, has, has kind of played uh, a part through that, uh, through my career. Thank you, Rachel. That's great, Alan. Thank you for that. Eleanor, I might uh, get you to introduce yourself, please. Sure. Um, so thank you for having me here today. Um, I too would like to uh, acknowledge and celebrate the uh, traditional custodians of the lands on which we all meet and over whose airwaves we uh, communicate today. I'm standing um, on the campus of the Australian National University at the foothills of um, what the local settlers have called Black Mountain. Um, I only found out very recently that uh, it's been um, uh, made politically correct. It used to be called Black's Mountain and the local settlers called it that because it was a local meeting place um, for the generation and transmission and creation of knowledge. So it's um, apt that I stand here um, at the foot of that, that mountain. So I'm standing on Ngunnawal land, Nambri land. Um, so about me, um, I have no idea what I want to be when I grow up and I kind of never have. Um, I came to adulthood during the last re major recession that Australia had um, and was faced with some fairly limited life choices when I came to the end of my undergraduate degree, which was in um, physics. So uh, at the time, um, there was a global worldwide um, uh, fool's errand to try to create uh, the uh, detectors that could detect um, uh, gravitational waves, which were the last theoretical prediction of um, Einstein. Almost one, exactly 100 years after he made that prediction, we did indeed detect our very first gravitational wave, proving um, that particular theory. Um, after I finished my PhD, I went on to yet another um, grand global challenge full of yet another fools, um, a set of uh, very smart fools, uh, and joined the um, worldwide initiative to try to build a quantum computer. So I've spent the last 25 years or so working in the area of quantum computing. Um, it started in the uh, realms of uh, the crazy theoretical realms of um, theoretical physics, moved into experimental physics. Um, quantum computing itself has moved it from experimental physics into electrical engineering. And these days, the great forefront of um, quantum computing is actually in computer science. So um, at some point, I will be old enough that quantum computing will just be a commodity product um, and my work will be done. So um, that's kind of uh, my particular background. I've uh, worked in, um, uh, in universities. I've worked in uh, government research agencies. I've worked in private um, research companies. I've came back to universities. I've made a few concerted attempts to leave STEM and the higher education sector. And you can see that I've failed to achieve escape velocity in any of those yet. Um, and the thing that um, ties it all together for me is that I'm motivated by making a difference and making a difference at increasing levels of complexity and scale. So these days I'm the Dean of Engineering and Computer Science at the Australian National University and we are um, working very hard to think very carefully about how we educate um, uh, people who will not just be the, um, the future leaders of um, engineering and computing and schools of thought around that, but also how we bring those skills to people who are never going to be computer scientists, who are never going to be engineers, and to um, give them the kind of outlook and expertise 
and ways of thinking that will um, just be so important as we build the world around us that we all want to live in. Um, 2020 has been a year like no other. We were talking earlier before this um, presentation started um, and I said that living in Canberra, we've been through um, bushfires, smoke, a second round of bushfires, a second round of smoke, hailstorms that wreaked um, destruction on the through the very centre of Canberra. And then of course, um, uh, one of the world's greatest global pandemics hit um, all of Australia. So um, that's going to become, these kinds of defining moments are going to become um, more and more frequent for us as the world accelerates. And uh, given that we live in such a highly interconnected, heterogeneous world where um, computing information and the connection between all of us and all of our people uh, is going to be given driven by the things that we make, it's really, really important that we have um, an engaged and educated and agentful citizenry so that we can um, move forward together in a, in a way that we all want to go together. So that's what I'm doing. Now yeah, that's wonderful, Eleanor. Thank you for sharing that. And over to you, Richard. Um, I've really enjoyed listening to Eleanor and um, Alan talk. And I do find whenever I talk to anyone in STEM, they've always got such a fantastic story. We're such a collection of um, quirky oddballs, aren't we? So I'll tell you my quirky oddball story, but I bet it's no different to yours in, in, in magnitude. Um, I'm a mathematician, so I, I've always loved maths. And I, my first career was being an actuary. I did an economics degree. Um, but I also managed to do uh, a lot of computing and electronics while I was studying um, actuarial. Um, under, in fact, under Dave Skellen, who I think might be talking at your next event, a wonderful man. Um, and I really enjoyed that. So when I was working as an actuary, it was a, it was a little bit interesting, but it was also a lot boring for me. Uh, and I, I started thinking, when was I last really happy and inspired? And it was when I was at uni studying STEM things. So I went back to uni and did another degree. Um, and, and then when I was doing that uh, degree in science, I, um, I sort of thought part of being a scientist was to communicate. And I really should teach others as well. So I did a little bit of teaching and I really liked the teaching. So although I liked the research and I liked the STEM, uh, I suddenly felt I was making a difference rather than helping a rich insurance company get slightly richer. Uh, I was actually helping individual children at a much smaller scale, less people. Um, but I, I really liked it. So I, I resigned. I was no longer a fellow at the Institute of Actuaries. I don't know if anyone else has ever resigned from being a fellow. It's such a lucrative thing to be. And I went back to being a highly underpaid, um, tenuously employed academic, which I've loved ever since. Um, and I'm now at the University of New South Wales. Uh, and I, my passions are teaching uh, people who are just starting in computing. I really like getting the students early to help them get the right mindset and a sort of an engineering scholarly sort of mindset for computing. And I'm cyber now. I've been doing cyber maybe for nearly 20 years, cybersecurity, because I think it's a really important problem to solve. A bit like Eleanor was talking about in the world. Um, you know, and I'm sure you all know about this notion of coupling that a well-designed system isn't tightly coupled. And if a system's too coupled, um, then you can have catastrophe because, you know, um, things that are tightly connected and a change in one can have unexpected consequences that are too complex to anticipate in a tightly coupled system a long way away. We saw that with Challenger and Three Mile Island and all that sort of thing. So as the world gets more tightly coupled, as, you know, I guess in the old days, if you hacked into my computer when I was a teenager, you could change my um, Donkey Kong score. Whereas nowadays, if you hacked into a computer, you can get my money. You can find my friends. You can listen to my conversations. You can turn on my camera. You can... Uh, track my location, you can launch nuclear weapons, you can drive and control cars, you can change uh, traffic reports and you can transfer money, you can change the outcome of elections. So now that things are really tightly coupled and computers are enmeshed in how we live our lives, increasingly virtual lives, the whole security thing's becoming really interesting. And if we don't solve that, I actually see it as an existential threat to sort of civil society. So as with Eleanor, I'm I'm really passionate about what I do now, which is trying to improve and increase um, cybersecurity literacy, not just amongst cybersecurity people, but actually everywhere. Because again, like Eleanor said, I'm just repeating you, Eleanor. It's when I started in computing, the geeky people went and learned programming and there was a small number of us and we taught each other. And, and when I was teaching computing, I was teaching people just like me. And actually I think that's the wrong thing to do. I think as computers become more and more enmeshed in our lives, 
people need to be empowered and understand them. And that's everyone from um, retired people to people still in primary school. And people need to understand privacy and people need to understand security because it affects us all. It's just part of literacy now, like seatbelts and sunscreen. So, so that's my passion and I, I love it. And I love teaching and um, I love computing. So I'm just a very happy chappy today. <laughs> I love it. And I think um, everyone will agree that's listening to this, that we've got three very passionate contributors today. So that, that's wonderful. Uh, Alan, I might go back to you to uh, kick off and get your opinion on the topic of, you know, the role of computer science in preparing future leaders. And, and Richard's given us a few thoughts there. Um, I'd really like to hear yours. Yeah, thank you. And I would also strongly echo uh, Richard's sentiment that, that really computer science should be considered uh, akin to lit literacy these days. It really is something um, very, very uh, fundamental. Um, like others, I tend to think of computer science as, as, um, as a foundational degree or an enabling degree. Uh, you could, I think it's, you know, you could almost compare it to, say, a degree in, in English literature in the 19th century, or, or dare I say, I know there's some scientists on the panel, um, like a science degree in the 20th century. It's, it's really fundamental in that it enables, um, um, you know, uh, enables us to do things in new ways uh, in, uh, across a wide variety of uh, disciplines. Google and others have used the term CS plus X, so computer science plus X, to kind of capture this symbiotic relationship where X is some domain or field of you know, human endeavor that is enabled uh, by CS. Uh, expressed another way, you can think of CS as uh, you know, fundamentally about how we use computers to help us to solve you know, complex problems in, in a number of domains. Now the CS practitioner um, is, is you know, using um, a new set of skills or relatively new set of skills which are commonly referred to as computational thinking skills and this is, you know, a wide range of, uh, um, you know, skills, you know, logic, reasoning, abstraction, you know, pattern recognition, um, generalization, modeling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, incidentally, you often hear that, you know, uh, often hear um, people fixating on coding, 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 coding. Well, coding is just the implementation part of, of, of computer science. Um, uh, those broader skills are actually much, much more relevant. Um, so this uh, CS plus X notion is actually, it's not really terribly new uh, in the sense that, you know, scientists have known about this, this notion of, uh, of using CS to empower their relative, you know, disciplines for a very, very long time. You know, in, we talk about, you know, computational physics, which is CS plus physics or, or computational chemistry, or even, um, um, you know, CS plus biology is bioinformatics. So these, these, have, these have been around for a while. Um, I think, you know, scientists have really understood, um, you know, what now everyone, now everyone else is now increasingly realizing that CS when combined with another discipline uh, can bring new insights and, and new ways of, you know, approaching things and solving problems. Um, a few other examples, if you think about, you know, CS plus finance, you've got, you know, FinTech. If you think about CS plus health, you've got, you know, products like Fitbit. You think of CS plus um, music, you've got you know, products like Spotify, the list goes on and on and on. Um, so the opportunities are endless. And I think um, my own career progression kind of highlights this just to kind of expand a little bit on that. You know, early on in my career, I was passionate about computer aided engineering or CAE. I started out, as I said, as an electronics engineer, and I was very interested in, in integrated circuit design or IC design. So my X, you could say was, you know, CAE or IC design. And I applied AI techniques which at the time I have to say somewhat embarrassingly rule-based expert systems, no one does it anymore. But, um, but anyway, I was applying AI to the problem of solving uh, or debugging integrated circuits. So later on, my passion became um, personalized information. How can we deliver personalized information uh, to people? Um, and I use the internet as a way to kind of design and build so-called change detection notif notification services. And that was the basis for my first startup in California back in, uh, 1996 company called Netmine, and I've skipped a few iterations. But most recently, as I mentioned uh, in the intro, my passion now is is ocean conservation. I'm passionate about the oceans for the simple fact: if the oceans die, our planet dies. It's that simple. Uh, I love the fact that every everyone on this panel's got a passion, and one of the things I encourage uh, is you know follow your passion. I almost don't care what your passion is; just follow it and make a difference. Uh, mine, it's, it's the oceans and how we can actually save our planet from dying by keeping our oceans uh, vibrant and healthy. 
Uh, so here, the X is how you can basically apply technology and computer science to solving problems of uh, ocean conservation, ocean monitoring. Um, and OzOcean has embraced that mission. Um, our mission is to basically help our oceans through the use of technology. I think it's the ability to flex and to apply uh, computer science to, to different disciplines, different domains, is what makes CS a very good degree. Uh, and this is why I think the degree, it is a useful uh, building block, a useful degree in education, in educating future leaders uh, in, in a fast changing world. I'll stop there for just. <laughs> yes, no, that's fine. That's fantastic, Ellen. And I think the ocean is very lucky to have your passion. Uh, Eleanor, can I, can I throw to you now? Sure, um, and so vigorous nods from me, Ellen. Um, uh, so, so I guess um, the, the topic today was to talk about um, what tertiary computer science, um, what role it can play in, term, in um, setting up future leaders for success. Uh, and so what I thought I'd do is um, pick on a, a few of the, those key words, particularly around um, uh, tertiary and science and leaders. And I thought I'd come at it from a slightly different direction just to, to bounce the conversation in, a, in another way. Um, and talk about it from the perspective of, of knowledge and in particular um, the school of thought that sits around the anthropology of knowledge. Uh, and uh, I thought I'd start by telling, telling a story that um, this group um, probably knows about already but think about it slightly differently. So um, there's been a, a recent uh, movement to um, uh, connect uh, 5G mobile phone towers and COVID-19 together. Uh, and there are a range of different different theories around why they might actually be connected. One is that um, uh, the, the 5G signals are indeed somehow or other actually transmitting the coronavirus. Another is that the signals are actually uh, modifying cells inside of human beings to make the virus inside of us. And another one is um, simply that COVID-19 has been released into um, our community to force us to all be locked down so that the um, people who want to set up 5G can actually go out and build the towers. Um, and the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the theory has taken off well enough that something, something like between 20 and 40 uh, 5G towers in the UK have actually been burnt and vandalised and, and destroyed. And so this group of people who has a particular worldview and a particular set of understanding has to ask the question, well, so how on earth is it possible that people could have connected such fundamentally different things like um, electromagnetic waves and um, a virus? Uh, and interestingly, the anthropology of knowledge can actually provide some answers to that. So, so there is a school of thought that talks about the idea that knowledge is predicated, is, is comprised of three things. One is a corpus of assertions. Um, another is um, the, the media through which those um, assertions are transmitted and represented. And the last piece is um, the social structures that uh, uh, create people who are or in particular positions of authority who define what is truth and whether or not um, these particular assertions are correct. And so um, how does that happen? Well, if you, life is a lit series of lived experiences and as you experience them, what you do is you add them to your um, corpus of knowledge inside of your own head and you try to make sense of them in some particular way and you will probably engage with, the, with people whose um, uh, expertise you consider to be um, of high veracity and whose position you trust and to try to make sense of this. And so that's kind of how we all build our own corpus of knowledge and it, it crafts the way we think about things in, and essentially it allows us to understand how we interpret the world and how we act and we move through our lives and through the world as we go. So to some extent, um, we're actually making our own worlds as we move through our life experiences. And so, you know, if you have a, um, are experiencing a, a a series of life-changing changing events like the COVID-19 crisis. Um, somebody whose opinion you trust tells you that there, that there is um, uh, some connection between that and mobile phone towers. And they also tell you that you can um, take charge of your own life and potentially uh, fix it for you and your family and for the people around you and just make it better. Then some people are going to take that opportunity and they're going to fix it. And suddenly they become followers to a particular leader. So the question that, I, that I'm, I'm interested in exploring perhaps today is to come at, um, come at, come at it from a slightly different pers um, perspective to, to Alan um, and to come at the question from the other direction, which is to say, okay, well, so if we have a bunch of uh, leaders in our society, we've got 
politicians, business magnates, who at the moment are making decisions that are governing our entire lives and they're making sense of the world around our entire lives, do they actually have a corpus of knowledge around computer science particularly so that they can make sense of that in a way that uh, creates the kind of world that we would want to live in? And I'll give you one specific example before I, before I shut up. Um, coronaviruses tend to break out around the world. Novel coronaviruses break out on average about once every six years at the moment. So the next one that comes along, by then we are likely to be um, doing at least some in silico vaccine development. We're likely to be doing at least some predictive epidemiology to figure out where outbreaks are most likely to occur and who are most likely to be the carriers of that. Now, this group of people probably um, could spend hours talking about what, um, what CS technology sits underneath that and what are the pros and cons of doing that sort of thing. At least in Australia at the moment, we have leaders who are willing to trust the science and willing to listen to the science. Um, but next time around, that science is not just going to be epidemiology, it's not just going to be immunology and virology, it's likely to also require some grasp of computing and computing concepts. And are they going to be able to make sense of that world in ways that allow them to make decisions that would have them make the kind of world that we want to live in and that we would like to live in? So in other words, can universities actually educate people in computing sufficiently that um, they, we will actually have leaders that we all want to follow? So not gonna, um, I'm not going to finish with a question. Oh, I love that, Eleanor. And I know there's lots within the PC um, friends that actually are, are passionate um, believers in increasing the digital and sort of scientific understanding of many leaders and, and government um, people. So um, we're with you there. I might throw to you now, Richard. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Eleanor, and thank you, Alan. Um, I, I do think if we're looking at what CS teaching is like now, and I'm assuming our audience, uh, if they've done CS, would have done it a few years ago. Um, so I, I just, I was musing about that. How has it changed, say, since I was a student? So I, I sh first of all, I should reassure everyone it's very different. Uh, secondly, I think there's a growing appreciation of the thing that Eleanor was talking about. Uh, oh, and Alan too, which is CS isn't just for computer science students. It's not just for coders. CS is literacy for everyone. And we need to widen the funnel, not just teach. I mean, there's always a temptation when we, when we talk about pushing computer science into high school or primary school. The temptation is, I'm sure you've all found that if you're teachers listening, you want to teach people who are like you and you sort of assume everyone is like you. And of course, most people aren't like you. So the temptation in widening um, computer science literacy, I guess, is to teach the things you would have liked to have learned, but teach them a bit earlier. And let's teach basic versions of them a bit younger. But actually the people we need to teach are very different to your traditional geeky computer science person, because I sort of want them in the profession. I want my, my creatives. I want um, lateral thinkers. I want right brain and left brain people. I want people who aren't so rule bound. Um, oh, Alan, you were talking about um, uh, rule based AI systems. I, I reckon, actually, and you said that maybe they're not taught or used anymore. I was just thinking about it. Maybe that's not true. I'm pretty sure the robo debt system, though I have no knowledge of it, is probably a very sophisticated rule based AI deciding who's going to. Uh, <laughs> get their benefits taken away on that. So um, basically that's the problem we have when we have rules set up by people of one sort, they only apply to people of that sort and so on. So I think the widening and getting a really diverse group of people in and, and rethinking entirely how we teach computing, not just teach it earlier and simpler and younger, but teach it differently. Um, I, I think that is um, the big challenge facing us all. And I think everyone's grappling with that and universities certainly are. And at my university, UNSW, we're trying to get as many people as possible to take computing as a literacy thing. Um, so how is computing different? And, and the question um, that you mentioned at the beginning was in terms of leadership. Is that right, Rachel? You're interested in knowing how computer science, the way it's taught in tertiary at the moment is preparing future leaders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I think this is, is the key. It's such a good question. I don't want any of my students to grow up and get a job and be the person in the back room that other people boss around and make use of and get rich uh, off and run companies and do initiatives and come up with policies and occasionally go back and consult. 
I want my students to be leading. I want them to be starting the companies, them to be running the companies, them to be running the country. Um, so I think in terms of bringing about change in the world, I need to be able to teach my students how to bring about effective change so they can do it rather than, than me doing it. That's my sort of multiplication strategy. Um, so we teach a whole range of things. Uh, from our very first courses now, we, we look at communication. We have a leadership strategy and we teach them leadership explicitly. We focus a lot on community, which is people helping each other. When I started computing, we were very much, it was a solo sort of thing. I love maths and maths is very much an inner world. It's just me and my brain and just sitting in there doing fun things and being amazed by beautiful things. But um, in order to bring about change and lead, you actually have to get out of that world and look at other people. And for some of us, if that's our expertise, it can be a bit challenging. So what I always try and um, get set up early in their expectations when they start university is for young computer science students to see that the university is there to change them. It's a resource. And rather than just using it to get better at the things they're already good at, they should work out the things they want to get good at. They should work on their weaknesses. They should sort of have a plan for the sort of person they want to be at the end. And it's always tempting to do the thing. I know when I'm procrastinating, I do the job that I like the most. Um, but actually what I really, that's not always the most important job. So we do try and teach leadership and community from the beginning. And we have a whole range of strategies for doing that. So we, we have this culture where once you've done a course, the expectation is you will then come back and help the students doing the course the next time it runs as a mentor. And as you get older, you'll come back as a tutor. Uh, and we have this notion of paying forward. Once we've done that for a few years, which we've now been doing it for 15 years, the students themselves, when they turn up, are taught by student, former students just a year or sometimes just a semester ahead of them. Um, and so there's an expectation that that's normal practice. Of course, that's what you do. You go back and help the next lot. Um, and that's a really lovely thing. And I've seen that extend into the professional world as my students go out to the professional world now. It's a lovely community, community I think, the computing, especially the security community, people helping each other. And Alan, I, I have never officially thanked you, but when you were um, heading up everything at Google Sydney, you allowed the students, a lot of my former students, to come back and use some of their 20% time to be tutors. And I, that was just such a wonderful thing to do. Can I, I just want to smile and wave at you and say thank you. I'd shake your hand if, if we were in the same place and I was allowed. But we had one year when the first year students, more than half of them were taught by Google engineers as their tutor. And they wanted all to be Google engineers. So this was very inspiring for them. And then when the Googlers were talking about, well, you need to have teamwork, you can't just be by yourself and you need to help others. And if you're a dick, no one will want to employ you or no one will want to work with you. And you have to not just do the fun things, you have to get your style right and do things and talk about essentially all the professional skills and attributes that we want the students to have. It was sort of more believable than when I spoke about it, some crusty old professor. Um, so that's important. Communication's important. We teach communication skills because uh, I mean, we're talking about COVID, but I mean, we could even think about global warming. How long have we known about that since the Club of Rome? The big, one of the, when I think about science, I'm so cross. I think we as scientists have all failed. It's a massive failure. We've known about it. We could blame politicians and others, but it's our failure. How can we know about something for 40 years and it's still there? Hmm. So I think our students need to grow up and know how to communicate effectively in order to bring about change. Uh, there's no point in being Cassandra and knowing things and no one being able to, no one acting on what you know. You've got to get it into other people's heads somehow. Um, and then I guess the last thing I'd like to say about the sort of the, the higher level skills other than the technical skills. And then I'll say, I'll say something briefly reassuring about technical skills at the end so everyone doesn't think it's become all kumbaya and the kids can't program and things like that. But if you think about the early missions to the moon, like the Apollo missions, um, and Tom Wolfe writes about this in The Good Stuff, The Right Stuff, those astronauts were selected, um, they were jet, um, you know, naval um, or Air Force uh, test fighter, fighter pilots normally. They were, came from a culture of machismo, of being individually heroic, of showing off, of, um, you know, of bra braggadoo, bra I don't even know how to say these words. Um, and and that, was, that was fine and that was good. But if we were sending someone to Mars now, it's generally accepted. That's not what we're looking for. We're not looking for individual heroes anymore. They're a bit useless. We actually need people who can work together as a team, who can look after each other when they're out there, uh, people who are good at community and don't always put themselves first. Not, not saying sometimes there's good times for that. So these skills, I think, are the 21st century skills that we need. Um, 
just to do our job well. Everything is, as I said before, tightly coupled. So we need to actually understand interconnection and how to interact with so many people. Gone are the days where you do something heroically by yourself. And the brief reassuring thing I wanted to say, and then I will shut up because I've spoken for way too long. I can see all these good questions, especially from Annette, um, that of course, that this is not instead of technical skills. There's no point in being able to talk about something if you can't also do it. So the technical skills just go without saying. I want my students, if they were shipwrecked on a desert island with just a piece of toothpick and, uh, and, and a bit of licorice, I'd like them to be able to rebuild a computer and build the internet and call for help. I, I need them to know everything from transistors or lower all the way up. I, I want them to be full stack engineers. I want them to have complete and deep understanding. And that is so satisfying and pleasurable to know that, that that's what they want too. So we're not neglecting those skills. We're just noticing that those skills by themselves without the plus X that Alan was talking about, they're just not, not as useful. Um, so that's, that's my summary. Oh, thank you so much, Richard. And can I encourage people that are listening to throw in Q and A and also any comments they have on, on this very fascinating uh, discussion. Um, I do want to touch on some of Annette's questions. Uh, and I suppose I want to start it with the role of industry. Uh, so Alan, I might talk to you since you have gone across the fence a number of times, you know, what is the role of um, industry in shaping CS courses um, and also the role of or the value of work experience um, within courses? Uh, so Richard touched on this, but I think it would be great if Alan, if you if you kicked off this uh, off this answer. Sure, oh, happy to do that. Thanks. That's uh, a very good question. So. Uh, Industry has a huge role to play, obviously, uh, in, in many, many different ways. I mean, both uh, participating in, uh, you know, industry advisory um, uh, groups and, and kind of shaping, uh, you know, future uh, curricula. But uh, I would say probably even more importantly, um, I, and, and I think Richard alluded to some of this too, just the actual interchange of, of people and ideas between, you know, academia or universities and industry. Um, and um, one of the things that, um, certainly industry can, can give back uh, in the way that say, for example, 20% timers at Google have done that. That's one direct way. Uh, another way industry can, I think, play a really, really important role is, is through student interns and just participating in intern programs and, and exposing, um, you know, pre-graduates to, to industry. Um, you know, there is, uh, there are things students will only learn when they're actually working side by side, you know, with other practitioners in industry. There's only, there's only so much we can rely on our academics and our, even the best and the brightest teachers to impart. And sometimes students just want to see it, uh, you know, from, you know, from, from people working in industry as well. There's, there's some of that too. So that's definitely an area where industry, I think, has an important role to play. And by the way, I, I, we talked a little bit about Google, but I'm also firmly of the view that, you know, it doesn't matter how big or how small your company is, there are opportunities. I mean, right now, OzOcean currently has four paid staff. We are tiny, and yet every year we run an internship program with three uh, interns. So that's a pretty good ratio. Imagine if every industry player had a ratio of three interns for four employees, you know? Uh, and it's a multidisciplinary team as well, I might add. We, typically, we have two uh, interns um, from tech or engineering, CS, engineering uh, disciplines, uh, and one from one of the sciences, such as uh, bio marine biology. So huge opportunities also, uh, not just for students, but also for the industry, for the companies to kind of gain, uh, you know, insights into, in, into, into students. And, and frankly, uh, a great strategy from a hiring standpoint, recruiting standpoint as well. So they're just some of the ideas. Um, I think the other thing that some people uh, may not realize about industry is, um, and this is, this, is, this is true of the larger players, you know, the, the, the Googles, the Amazons, the Microsofts, admittedly, but not, 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 uh, not entirely so, but there's enormous amount of research uh, going on, you know, in industry. Uh, and some of that is, is happening simply because, you know, some of these large companies have access to large, you know, large uh, amounts of data, large corpora that simply aren't available to academics or, you know, with, you know, oftentimes, you know, available only <laughs> uh, at great difficulty. So that also presents opportunities, uh, you know, for, you know, I think opportunities for, um, um, for um, you know, whether it's joint research or, or really, you know, um, uh, you know, the, um, 
uh, people working in industry and getting access to essentially solving problems that aren't necessarily available in academia too. So, uh, but it, that, again, I, I don't think that's just the realm of, you know, large companies. I mean, uh, at Oz Ocean, we're solving some really interesting problems too. How do you automatically, uh, you know, classify fish species in real time? Uh, you know, uh, a, a very pressing problem as it turns out with also commercial uh, applications as well as, you know, in, you know, environmental monitoring applications, but huge opportunities to do that in partnership with, uh, with universities, but also, you know, industry as well. Um, one thing, one thing that um, I think has changed um, uh, computing, uh, well, one of many things that's changed computing is the advent of these uh, cloud platforms, you know, Google's cloud, Amazon's cloud, Microsoft's cloud, which uh, not just a platform for like computing, but also a platform for a whole array of services. If you want, you know, you want vision services or computer vision services, you want, you know, machine translation services, you can essentially now, you know, pay for these services, you know, on demand, you know, utility commuting, hook them up and then, uh, and then essentially bolt them on your application. Um, what's exciting about that is you don't necessarily have to be an expert in computer vision or an expert in automatic translation or machine translation, but you can use these services and focus on the problem that you're trying to solve, which might be, for example, you know, fish classification. Um, so that's just a, another area where industry can provide, I think, some real benefit, um, real benefits through these, through these platforms and these services. So I'll just probably stop there for now. Do Eleanor or Richard want to jump in there, or should we move on? Richard, did you want to comment? You've um, you've educated something like thirty thousand computer scientists. So, well, actually, well, let's be precise. I've taught something like thirty thousand. <laughs> I can only talk about the inputs, not the output. Okay. <laughs> um, no, look, I think I've I've spoken enough, um, and I think Alan captured it really well. Um, uh, and Alan, I would my only comment I would make is listening to you. You are a teacher, thank you. And, and this industry university nexus is, is so important. And it really, we're asking companies to be teachers. And you always have been, companies always have been. Um, mm -hmm. I shouldn't say you, because I, I was in a company for a while. Companies mm -hmm. have always done training and, and they've all, always been individuals in companies and leading companies who, who have seen a, a role in developing their staff and letting them to go on and do other things. And, and that's what you're doing. And I think we all teach from parents to high school teachers, to uni teachers, to to random people on the street that give me advice when I'm walking around with my babies. Um, you know, it's just human nature to help each other. So, but great to see you doing it. Hmm. Eleanor, did you want to add anything there? Oh, look, what I might do is um, bounce off Richard and go into um, a next question around the, the, the uh, proposal from Google to um, start to yes. educative services. So they're not I'll the only major one. Yeah. They're not the only major company to, to be thinking about that. Um, and I, I guess that there's, a, there's a number of ways of thinking about that. And it's always worth asking, what is the problem that they are trying to solve? Um, and the problem that they are trying to solve is that they can't find enough people to employ who are appropriately qualified for the jobs that they've got going right now. Um, and my best guess would be that one of the things that's going to occur as a consequence of that is that they are going to fall into the training end of the spectrum as opposed to the education end of the spectrum. So there is a, there's a difference between them. And training is about preparing someone for the job they've got now or the, the next job that they're about to have, whereas education is actually about preparing someone for their career and for their life. It's about um, knowledge and concepts as opposed to skills and competencies. Um, it's a, it's, and, and so in that sense, uh, I, I, the, the, the respectful place in which I would put um, that set of work would be, okay, if, you've got a, if you have a screaming need for a very large number of people and um, universities are not providing them fast enough, uh, then yep, go for it. Um, if you have a university degree, something like this would be a wonderful way to keep yourself up to date. And I think we're all um, thinking very hard uh, about how one makes the pivot towards a journey of lifelong learning. The idea that you would get a four year inoculation of education that stops at the age of 21, I think is now just over. Um, and we're gonna need updates all through our lives. And so a journey that breaks um, your journey of lifelong learning into little bite-sized pieces that you can pick up as you go is something that we're all thinking about doing. And the question is, what is the point and what is the purpose? Um, universities are going 
to real have to realize i think that we don't own all of the space around education and we don't own all of the space about sending people into companies um but that's okay we've demonstrated that not only um not only can we not own it we, we simply can't own it we're not producing people fast enough um and in fact there was a period like this in the mid 1980s when um uh there was a a tech bust in the mid 80s and one of the reasons for it was because um, everybody thought it was fabulous. They wanted to start to hire people with these skills. And in fact, in fact, universities couldn't produce people fast enough. So uh, and what happened was that companies strip mined all of the expertise out of the universities uh, and it took a while to recover. The, um, the, the, the boom bust cycle in the 2000s was driven by something different. Um, and in fact, we're much more likely these days to be heading towards the kind of boom bust cycle from the mid eighties. And if we can find a solution that doesn't do that and we all find a place in the ecosystem where we're not cutting each other's grass and actually adding to each other, that's a helpful thing. Yeah. I, can I bounce off that too? No, absolutely not, Richard. <laughs> I, I agree with everything you said. I think that's, that's really insightful. Um, the, there was a time, maybe over the last decade or a bit further back, where we were, unis were grappling to deal with scale. And, and the education we were providing was a bit different to the education I got and perhaps the education you got. Um, and it did turn more into just training, skills training and acquisition and trying to just do things at scale and move information from a centralised bucket into the bucket inside of everyone's heads. And there has been a shift, I'm delighted to say, in university education, um, thinking more holistically about what sort of people do we want to turn out and what sort of lifelong skills do we want them to have? And this is the very questions that I can see. And it's essentially, you're asking the same question over and over again in lots of different ways, and I love it, which is, so what is the point of a uni? And if we are just doing job training and teaching them a whole lot of facts, then how sad is that? I'm really pleased if Google's going to go and do that because it'll stop us doing it because um, we can't compete with, you know, and, and we shouldn't. What we can do is turn out people who are thinkers, who have cognitive skills and who have ways of ways of being. So um, why, should indus uh, why should industry hire a CS under CSE undergrad? What value can they bring? Well, you should hire them because my students are awesome. They're fantastic. Not because of the facts that I taught them, because you can find those on Google, but because of the people they are and hopefully have become, hopefully we can claim a little bit of credit for helping them. Um, and I see them going out and I just, my toes curl thinking about what they're going to do. And because I've been teaching for so long now, I can see what my former students have done. They're out there running the world. They're doing all sorts of amazing things. So our students are fantastic. And if you're lucky enough to get one, gee, how, how good is your company going to be? Um, so uh, what percentage of the skills do you learn at uni do you still rely on today? Same question. I'm glad you said the word skills. If you said knowledge, then sort of not very much of it at all. Um, but if, you, um, but if you say skills, then I'd say all of it, like my critical thinking, my persistence, my skepticism, my love of knowledge, the ways that my maths professors taught me to value a beautiful proof and formal proof and rigor, the, the notion of what is a beautiful proof or a beautiful program rather than just a random thing that happens to work now, uh, all of these values and skills and the way I approach problems, the way I don't give up when I'm trying to approach a problem, the way I'm cheerful, even when everything's falling to pieces around me, because if you're a computer scientist or a programmer, things are constantly falling to pieces all around you all the time. That's our normal thing. So you need to have sort of things of dealing with that. And also, uni, I was a bit proud when I went to uni and I thought I was so smart, I guess, because I'd gone to a school where there weren't lots of people interested in things I was interested in. And if they were the only things I valued, I sort of was ahead. But when I was at uni, I met, and when I was teaching at schools as well, high schools, unis, primary schools, you suddenly meet so many people that are so much smarter than you. And, and it gives you this sort of humbleness and it opens your mind and lets you listen to things. And I guess that's the 5G question we're talking about. How do people listen to things rather than being comfortable with what they know? And if uni taught me anything, it was question myself, never be sure of anything and, and listen to others because there's wisdom in the thoughts of lots of others. So those skills are fantastic. Gee, you're lucky if you get any of my students, I'd say. It's interesting. We had a conversation, or well, I had a conversation last week with um, Alison Harcourt, who I saw was actually on the line. And um, yes, Richard, I, get, I see you smiling. I was very, very lucky. Um, but she was saying that she went to university 
just because she wanted to know more about something. So she, it's sort of that X thing that she had, you know, that she really, and I just wanted to talk about that whole thing of the deep dive and the research element of universities. And, and, and the, I mean, because all of you have gone on with your study. Um, can I just ask you to, to talk about how important that is um, in the role of CS C, and, and its future? Um, all right, I'll, I'll kick off. Um, uh, and I guess I'd like, I guess one way to think about this is um, it's actually, it's actually as much to do with learning ways of solving, identifying good problems and solving them as it is anything else. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the old adage that would, do you want to go to a university and be taught from the textbook or taught by the person who wrote the textbook? Uh, and that's that's actually part of the part of the question there, um, and that comes to again this 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 sense of okay well so um, how do you identify a good quality problem how do you tackle it how do you find the beautiful solution as Richard put it um, that is what uh, that's that's mostly what a research training experience actually gives you um, uh, the kinds of the kinds of research that you know I, I can speak to personal experience um, I. Hold, I, I hold two world records, one for um, uh, the world's fastest um, quantum state that I'm pretty sure nobody care, cares about anymore. And the other is I used to hold the world record for the world's fastest quantum random number generator. Um, are either of these things particularly important or useful now? I no. wish you could hear us clapping. That's amazing. No, my, my, no, no. My point being, neither of them are particularly useful or interesting now. It happened 10, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, but what I, what what that, um, the training that led me to those and the training that I have carried forward ever since is the thing that is in fact, I think most interesting and most important now. Um, and it's about being in an environment where you are provoked to, to tackle interesting problems and to develop the, um, the, the corpus of knowledge that allows you to approach them in particular ways. So um, part, of your, part of your educative experience in universities is that. And one of the things I would say is that in fact, interestingly, there is another role for industry here which is that uh, particularly in really large scale ICT, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the most pointy and interesting and challenging questions are, are being posed by people who are contain most of the information in the world in their databases um, and in their data centers and how they actually tackle those. So again, you have to ask the question what's motivating them to solve those problems, but there are some really important and interesting questions there and they're not in universities. So, um, there's, there's a range of reasons why research becomes important. It's also what creates the ideas. The ideas that we're tackling now are the ones that will escape into the wild in 15 years and change the world around us. So that's kind of um, part of why we do it as well. I, I think that's really true. I mean, what really it's not the research that we do at uni, really it's, the fact that we're asking the questions and we are doing research that's the, the most important thing and that we're modeling that and that our students perhaps have that and society values that this, this notion of questioning and trying to solve problems i think is very good there's there's been some great comments from Anne and and, and philip um i i think that from my point of view if my students fall in love with research. And by that, I don't mean ivory tower research, fall in love with asking questions, noticing what's an important question that should be asked, and then having the persistence and the rigor to go about coming up with a sensible answer or knowing how to, to that question. That's the sort of citizenry I want the world to have. They don't have to actually solve research questions. They just have to be open to that. And so, and Anne's asking all these CS students, they go out, they're, they're high flyers, they get paid lots of money, and they essentially get diverted and they're not doing great CS anymore. They're, they're, they're retiring or doing other things. Um, I, I think that our role as, I mean, that's a temptation. That's the danger temptation for my students that, that instead of going out and doing perhaps what will make them happiest, it's tempting to go out and do what will make you richest because the richest is very rich. And that's exactly the temptation I had when I was an actuary. Do I want to have a life being rich or a life doing good and, and meaningful? And, and I chose one way and I'm very open to anyone choosing whichever way they want to go. But I would like to give all our students, equip them with a good set of tools to make that decision sensibly. 
and thoughtfully. So when they get to be 50 or 60 and they look back on their life, they don't suddenly have a regret. That was my main thing. If, if, I'd, I'd like them to be able to sensibly think in advance. And to me, that's the research mindset. Research is just asking questions. And when someone tells you the answer, being skeptical. Uh, and I think that's essential. Um, I'd, I'd love to know what you think, Alan. I, I absolutely agree with everything you just said. And, uh, I, you know, re research is not, let's not just equate research to ivory tower research. Research is about curiosity. Research is about having uh, an excitement to know more and, and, and the courage to kind of ask those questions. And I could not agree more with that. And I'll just give you a personal anecdote. Uh, I mentioned at the start of this panel that I lived in Japan and I'd studied Japanese all through high school and I fell in love with the language. Um, but if anyone who studied Japanese, it is, a, it is a notoriously tricky language to translate or, in, especially, or interpret in real time. And so I became very fascinated with this uh, problem of how do you translate? That was my curiosity, that was my passion. I didn't think of it as research, but I guess based on what you, you just, yes, it was kind of, it was a quest for how we can translate between these, uh, these, these very different languages where the, you know, the grammar is completely back to front. That, that passion drove my interest in AI. That, that in turn drove my uh, decision to, to, to go to Stanford and Silicon Valley. That in turn drove my interest in, in, in technology startup. The, the, the rest is here. I mean, I, I won't you know, say it all over again, but you know, if your students are finding you know, a passion about things and are curious about things, ultimately that is what is going to make the world better. And that is what is, when they are 50 years old, or in my case, 59, <laughs> look back and think, yes, um, I did make some smart decisions, hopefully, and I'm doing things that matter. So if there's one message, I think, for, you know, today's students or tomorrow's leaders, hopefully they, <laughs> they correlate, uh, it's, it's follow your passions and, and it's ask those questions and it's basically, you know, be curious. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I think on that note, we're going to have to leave it. It's been a wonderful discussion. We've only really touched the sides. Um, before I uh, welcome uh, the chair of the PC Foundation, Wayne, uh, to just thank you all. I just want to uh, thank you for, for encouraging all of us to think more about curiosity, courage, beautiful questions, and wish you all the best with your personal quests and encourage everyone on the line to keep uh, we'll make sure that we re record and keep, sorry, to publish the recording and also keep the Q&A um, as an artifact because there's been so many interesting things shared. Um, and I think we will, of course, have to revisit this wonderful conversation because there are so many uh, things we'd like to explore about the history, uh, about the present and also uh, the future of computer science. So thank you all for... for um, joining us today and I'd like to introduce Wayne Fitzsimmons, the chair of the PC Foundation, to say a few words. Thanks, thanks very much Rachel, um, Alan, Eleanor um, and uh, Richard, I, thank you so much for your contribution and in, I'm inspired and excited by your passion and I understand the people, my colleagues in PSC, we're passionate about the ICT industry and I think you've helped us define why we bother. We want to promote this industry to everybody, all Australians and, and all Australia, that this is, we're very good at this stuff. So thank you. We're delighted to be a voice and make a contribution in some small way. And we're part of this uh, Victorian government's, uh, this, this event is part of the Victorian government's Digital Innovation Festival. It's our fifth year of involvement in this. And we want to thank Cathy Coltis, who's, uh, struggle she you know, led the, her team the strategic technology partnership and our deputy chair kelly hutchinson i'm sure is listening uh, has once again organized this fantastic broad program entirely virtual and a great job team victoria we have four more events i'll just touch on them briefly for a few minutes uh, just a couple of minutes um, next wednesday at 12 noon we've got a one and a half hour discussion round table organized by dennis tepper uh, the peace institute chairman talking about how Australia can enable a resilient future post this pandemic using our diverse technology capabilities. Then Wednesday evening, uh, four o'clock, we've two of our annual highlights are on. One is the presentation of the Victorian PSC Entrepreneur. This is the 22nd presentation of that. And then following that immediately is the eighth 
year of the PSC oration. And this year we've got John, uh, John Blackburn, AO, he's a former Air Vice Marshal. He's speaking about how Australia is addressing our resilience and prepare, preparedness in this age of mistrust and the uh, virus. And then next week, commencing on Monday morning, the 31st of August at 9.30 for five consecutive mornings, lasting 30 minutes, Kelly Hutchinson will host a novel event entitled Cards for the Future. The goal is to encourage people to think positive visions of tech and society through play. Please feel free to tune in and I'll be the first cab off the rank. Our fifth event starting Friday the 4th of September is a hackathon for high school students in collaboration with Museum Victoria Science Works and some prominent industry figures. We're asking students to think innovatively and pitch their ideas virtually for the future. This is the second year we've collaborated with and engaged with Science Works team to attract high school students towards having a STEM career. Registration of all these events is easy. Please visit our website, heritage.psc.org.au slash events slash. Just briefly, our conversation series, which is one is tonight, the last Wednesday of each month, we have several coming up. In, in Wednesday, the 30th of September, we'll be taking a look at uh, past and future of Wi-Fi from Radiata to Morse Micro. And to be sure, we've got Dave Scallum and, um, uh, Neil, anyway. Uh, Neil Westy. Neil Westy, yeah. They, they, these were the stalwarts of, of Radiata. So in October, we have a wonderful session coming up, Ada Lovelace Day, on the afternoon of Tuesday, the 13th of October. We're thrilled to be celebrating women's contribution to Australia's computing industry with Anne Moffat, Alison Harcourt, 90 Not Out, Helen Vorath, Judith Shared, amongst the amazing contributors that we've already got confirmed. This, this is a wonderful celebration of women's contribution to our industry. Also continuing over the month of October will be announcements of the State Entrepreneur Awards across the country, Queensland on the 6th of October, New South Wales on the 13th, and then we'll have our national awards on the 13th, 19th of November, and there'll be more of that com coming out. We will be sure to keep you updated with all the, 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 the details as we develop them. Thanks for attending today's conversation and getting involved in this, the fifth Victorian Government Digital Innovation Festival. I look forward to seeing you all again next Wednesday at noon. Enjoy your evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, everyone.